G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope that you are super well. Today I've got the latest photography and filmmaking news from around the web. Some articles here and there that catch my eye. And I have to thank Mr. Seth Miranda for pointing this out to me. The fact that Nikon is involved in helping create the latest Avatar film with Jim Cameron. How are they involved? Well, the technology for filming underwater has some Nikon product in it. Also, of course, we have some exciting other news from Nikon. If you haven't picked it up across the web or anywhere else, yes, we have two lenses development announced coming hopefully sometime soon. We'll talk about them. We also have some brand new cameras from Panasonic and so much more. All right, let's talk about it. Yes, I want to start off this episode with Nikon being involved in the latest Avatar film. And to the best of my understanding, they've actually shot episode two and three back to back. And how are Nikon doing this? Indeed, Nikon have been making extraordinary underwater glass for years. And this is being coupled with an amazing piece of technology that's made here in Australia. And it is known as the DeepX 3D. DeepX 3D is the world's first and only submersible 3D beam splitter. It is also the most advanced 3D underwater housing ever made. It has been used by James Cameron on Avatar The Way of Water to film underwater 3D sequences. DeepX 3D utilizes submersible Nikon, Nikonos submersible lenses, offering uncompromised optical performance underwater. It's just fantastic to see that Nikon that created these lenses over 30 years ago and still they're being used in a modern setting. They are still valid. That just shows how good that technology was back then. And I'm excited to share with everybody our friend Rishi at Rishi Talks has created a new series with Nikon Europe known as as Nikon Sessions. And this is about bringing professional photographers who work in all sorts of fields. And the first episode is about music and concert photographers and talking to them about their experiences. All of the guests are hardened professionals been in the industry, perhaps collectively amongst the four guests that were on the first episode. It would appear something like 60 to 80 years worth of experience between them a lot and they have photographed some of the most famous and epic bands the world has ever seen. Look, this is an exciting series. From my perspective, this is just real conversations with real photographers. It's very relaxed, it's, it's low key, it's engaging and all of these folks are super nice. So jump on Nikon Europe and watch some sessions and I believe there's more coming soon. And in other Nikon news, if you've managed to miss it somehow, yes, indeed, we have two fantastic lenses development announced. One is the 85 1.2, and the other one is the Pancake 26mm 2.8. Now, I put my video out a couple of days ago, and already there is a massive audience for both of these lenses. Those lenses are going to be two popular and widely purchased lenses from my perspective. And just before we jump out of Nikon news, yes, indeed, it looks like around the world the Z9 is starting to be in stock. I know, for example, here in Australia, they are on shelves and you can get them and you can get them delivered straight away. Also, our friends over in New York City in Adorama. So if you are in North America or wherever you want to ship a camera to, Jump on the Adorama website and you can get a free copy of Capture One, a license key for Capture One, the latest version, when you buy your Z9. So they're in stock and I know Adorama can ship you one straight away. Click on the link below. Indeed, the S52 and the S52X are coming soon. Now, I think the biggest thing that's come out of this for most people who watch this space regularly is that Panasonic have finally changed their focus system and they are finally using phase detect. Now, one of my favorite channels on YouTube is iPhone Do, and he has been a massive Sony supporter for years. And of course, 
I think it would be safe to say that across the board, Sony being the first to full frame mirrorless have had great focus. So they're a bit of a benchmark that everybody tries to get to. And what it appears here with the Panasonic being used how iPhone do does do his thing, it appears to be working pretty closely to how the Sonys work. Is it 100% the same? No, but in watching his half hour long video, there are pros and cons for both systems. So it would appear that Panasonic have come a really long way to creating a product which is compelling and can rub shoulders with all of the competition. That of course includes Fuji, Canon, Nikon, and the previously mentioned Sony. It's really great to see Panasonic in this space. This is an extraordinarily affordable camera. It is sub $2,000. It shoots 6K open gate, which means you've got a really useful video spec. The advantage of open gate in this ratio is, is that you get a taller frame and of course, portrait shooting is becoming more and more of a thing. I would recommend definitely all manufacturers should consider allowing open gate filming for those that want to use it. So this camera lands squarely in the middle of what we would call the mid tier. It's a good enough stills camera shooting at nine frames per second mechanical and 30 frames per second in electronic. It's gonna cover most people's use cases that just want a general all rounder at what I think is an extraordinarily affordable price point when you're considering the 6K open gate recording and when you're considering all the other features that it comes with. Of course, Panasonic tend to lean their cameras more into the video space. So if you wanna have a consummate video camera, again, affordable and an all rounder, this seems to be a great opportunity. It's 24 megapixels, 6K video, and now it has phase detect autofocus. This is just a quick overview, but from my perspective, from everything that I've gathered, from all the reviews that I've seen, I do think this camera, if you're in the Panasonic space, then it's definitely a good place to go. And maybe if you've got two or $3,000 to spend and you haven't headed in any particular direction yet, and video is your focus, well, at this price point, this could be a really good option. It's full frame, it has a built-in fan, which we're told is still weather sealed. And because of the heat sink and the cooling vents, this camera can shoot at its highest resolutions with absolutely no sign of it overheating. And basically your card will fill up or your battery will go flat before it even becomes a problem. And again, iPhone do tested it for a full, I think it was 90 minutes with not even any sign of it beginning to overheat. He lives in California. And in Sony news, Sony have created the Star Sphere project. And what this has done is put a Sony A7 IV into space. So you can photograph the world. Sony will be renting 90 minutes of time and you can presumably somehow remotely control the camera, the satellite, and photograph whatever you want on the ground. I would suggest you make sure wherever you're photographing, it's a clear day. The Star Sphere system will be launching sometime later in 2023. And at this time, there is no indication of what the pricing will be for your 90 minute rental. Also in Sony rumor news, there is rumors that a 24 to 70 F4 is coming soon and we might see it in the next week or so. Is anybody excited by that? Let me know in the comments below. And in late breaking news, just before I go, yes, DJI has released the Ronin RS3 Mini. It is a mini version of their current Ronin. And that of course is a gimbal for holding cameras and making moving, tracking, craning, and so on shots smooth making our footage look super professional. What's exciting about this gimbal is that it's half the weight, around seven to 800 grams. It's halving the weight based on the full-sized RS3. And its payload has been reduced to a maximum of two kilograms or 4.4 pounds. The gimbal offers remote control via a record button and you can do things like pull focus or zoom depending on what sort of hardware you have just from the button at the front. 
Along with all of that, it has 10 hours of usage time. It folds up nice and compactly, and it is compatible with a whole wide range of cameras from all of our favorite manufacturers. This looks like a really exciting option. Is the Ronin Mini for you? Let me know in the comments below. And we're going to end this episode by getting a little bit nerdy. This is just a bit of a look at data, dry data. If dry data is not for you, this is a good point to jump out. And I will say ta-ta. And to finish out this episode, I thought I'd just give some numbers from a Japanese retailer known as Map Camera. And they have published their sales for last year, January through to the 15th of December. And it's the most popular cameras and the most popular lenses. And there's some interesting data here. I mean, you could extrapolate all sorts of things. Obviously, every market is different around the world. So let's just quickly run through the 10 most popular cameras for this one retailer. I don't know how many stores they have in Japan, but this one retailer. So this is not definitive of anything in particular, but I love data and it's interesting. Number one is the Sony A7 IV. Two is the OM Systems OM1. Three, Canon EOS R7. Four, Nikon Z9. Five, Fuji X-T5. Six, Canon EOS RP. Seven, Canon EOS R6. Eight, Canon EOS R5. Nine, Nikon Z6 II. And 10, Canon EOS R3. Interestingly, Sony has only the one camera in the top 10. And that camera has been out the entirety of 2022. Interestingly, the Fuji X-T5 comes in at number five and it's only been out for something like two or three months. So I think it's done super well to get to that spot. Also, we have the Nikon Z9 in fourth position. And considering it's a flagship top tier, you know, obviously expensive camera, I think it's doing pretty well to be in fourth position because we can see that the Canon R3 is in 10th position. That's quite different. It's also great to see that Canon have, I think it's four or five cameras in the list. So they clearly continue to sell a lot of cameras. With the Canon R7 coming in at number three. So clearly that APS-C sensor, crop sensor camera has been super popular. All right, let's talk about the top 10 lenses. And coming in at number one is the Nikon 24 to 120 for Z mount. F4. Number two is the Nikkor 40mm F2. Three Canon 100 to 400. Four Sony FE 24 to 72.8, the new version. Five the Canon RF 50. Six the Canon RF 16. Seven the Tamron 28 to 75. Eight the Canon RF 24 to 105. Nine the Tamron 18 to 310. The Tamron 28 to 200. Now again, Canon is highly represented. Sony only has one, which is a Sony branded lens. There are two other third party Sony E-mount lenses towards the bottom of the list. And Nikon's at number one with the 24 to 120, which I think is an outstanding all rounder lens for its focal range, along with the f-stops you get with it. And it's just sharp all the way through. I mean, it is an S-class lens and all the S-class lenses really perform Excellently. Now, of course, the 40mm makes a lot of sense to me. It's an extraordinarily good lens for its price point, and its price point is spectacular. So it makes sense to me that it appears in this position. Now, there's no delineation between the two different variants there. I don't know if that includes the SE version or not, the special edition version. But these lenses not only work great in full frame, they also work fantastically on your APS-C cameras as well. So whether that's the Z50, ZFC, or Z30. So look, it's an interesting list. I think you can yield from that what we understand about the market in general, that Canon sells more stuff than everybody else. Sony's probably coming in around about second in general, although that might be quieting down a little bit in 2022. And then Nikon is in that third place which is pretty much what we've seen for, well, what? I don't know, the last four or five years. So everything is pretty much how we would expect it to be. The only thing that's a little bit different for me is I would have thought Sony might sell a few more bodies than just one in the top 10, just because, I don't know, Sony seemed to be so dominant, yet it's just the one.
Anyway, every year is different. I suspect if we were looking at this list a couple of years ago, there would be uh, more Sony cameras in that list if it was, say, 2017, 2018, 2019, years like that. All right, everybody. Well, just some interesting data to end this episode. And it's been so good to see you. Of the things that we've heard about in this episode, would you be interested in purchasing any of them? Are you going to be going for the new Panasonic? Perhaps you're interested in the 26 millimeter 2.8. Would you be hiring the Sony Starsphere to take photographs from space? 90 minutes, how much do we think that might cost? Please speculate in the comments below. It's been so good to see you. And if this is your first time here, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like, and jump on the link Grab a calendar, supports the channel, supports the capacity for us to be able to get all this content out. All right, look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now.